I think I should quit right now while I'm ahead. <laughs> After that introduction, I don't think I can improve on myself. I had a, it seems a, to be the order of the day to tell some kind of story on Johnny Ramsey. And I, I had a little story, but I, I, I said I wasn't going to tell it because I didn't see Johnny. But he drifted in, and he's there. And I guess maybe I should because so many other preachers start out that way. And, you know, you're supposed to follow preachers' examples. Well, <laughs> and, and they say, you know, some things that, you know, just couldn't be true about Johnny. So I'm going to say that he has followers away from this particular place. My wife and I were just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, at a little place called Lenore City. And you know, when you're traveling, you never know just whether or not you're going to find a faithful congregation. Well, we woke, we stopped at this church and opened, went through the front doors, and who do you think was the first person we saw? Johnny Ramsey. He was there, almost in Knoxville, and those people down there th think highly of Johnny. In fact, they're even inviting him back after he was there once. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple of years later, we were through Tennessee again, stopped at a church in Crossville, Tennessee, I believe it was, and guess, no, he wasn't there, but he was starting a meeting there the next week. We missed him by one week. Didn't have to hear him that time. But Johnny, the people in Crossville spoke highly of you. So I just wanted you to know that you have uh, a, a, scriptural, a scripture to fall back on that goes something like this. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. <laughs> I feel honored and privileged to be here at this moment in history, in this year of our Lord, 1999. You know, I approach this task with considerable apprehension. I've been out there in this audience where you are for many, many years, listening to the great preachers of the brotherhood. And this week has been no exception. Our preacher at Birdville did a marvelous job with his presentation. This young man that just finished, we need more of them. We need more of them. You know, I've been reminding myself almost from the moment I was Maxie called me. I keep thinking that I've got to remember one thing. I can do all things in him that strengthens me. And I need, to, <laughs> I need that strength right now, so you bear with me. And we'll get through this. First, I want to thank Maxie Bourne and the elders of Brown Trail for inviting me to be at this year's lectureship. There's no greater lectureship that I'm aware of in the Brotherhood. This is one of the top ones. As Maxie was saying, the Birdville Church has had a long and fruitful relationship with the work that this fine congregation is doing here at Brown Trail. Let me say this about Brown Trail. And I put some water right here to get me through this. And so you bear with me if I have to have a little. Sometimes I have some allergy problems. I can, I can blame it on that. 
But let me say this. I know of no greater concentration of sound gospel preachers who are dedicated to the truth under one roof than right here at Brown Trail. Now, some of you may. I, I do not. And there is nothing that sound elders in the church appreciate more than sound gospel preachers. And in my judgment, both are in short supply in the church today. When Maxie called me on April the 6th, I declined his invitation. You're already beginning to see why. Because I get a little nervous doing this. But I just thought he could find someone far better qualified than I. And so I declined. I gave him some reasons. Actually, they were excuses. Because from that moment, my conscience began to talk to me until I called Maxie back on the 8th and said if he hadn't filled that position, I would do the best I could with what I have to do with. So uh, I'm here, and if you'll help me, maybe I can say something that will help you in your congregations where you are, and maybe help some of these young men to, uh, well, it'll help them just see a real live elder up here in this position. <laughs> it should. But if, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, I ask that you bear with me if I tend to become somewhat emotional while discussing the heavy responsibilities connected with being an elder in the Lord's church. However, I serve willingly. I love the family at Birdville, and I want to see each one of them get to heaven. And I appreciate so much, so many of them that are here this morning, to lend me support. And as you can see, I need all the support I can get. The people at Burville are among the best Christians in all the world. I really believe that. Well, now to my assigned topic. Why... Is it important, in view of eternity, for elders to quit doing the work of deacons and concentrate on being shepherds? No Christian would dispute that dire consequences would result if we ignore the obvious answer to this question. But let me confess up front that I'm guilty guilty sometimes of not allowing our deacons to do their job so I'll have more time for mine. And I think that most elders fall in this category from time to time. There is an urgent need for us to change our modus operandi. As in most congregations, the deacons at Burville have assigned tasks. And we elders try to give them an opportunity to carry out these assignments. But sometimes, and I confess that I'm guilty of sometimes doing too much deacon work, and that then doesn't leave me as much time to do my job. And as all of you know, there's no end to the script, scriptural matters that need attention. No end. And Maxie aptly put it this way in his rationale statement on this topic. Elders must get back to shepherding. Shepherding the flock. Now one major element inherent in shepherding 
is to protect the flock from wolves and false prophets. Acts 20, 29, 30, Matthew 7, 15. I think the Birdville elders took a major step in this direction in 1992 by giving each member of the congregation the following letter. I think it goes to the heart of the matter under discussion and therefore feel like it's important enough to share it with you this morning. It goes like this. To the saints at Birdville, as elders, we have an obligation, yea, a grave responsibility, to take care of God's family that meets at the corner of Broadway and Carson in Halton City, Texas. Acts 20, 28 through 31, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, Hebrews 13, 17. Also, each of us has an obligation as Christians to uphold God's word universally. 1 Timothy 3, 15, Jude 3. That word is no longer held in, in respect as it once was. No longer is it recognized even in the church of our Lord as the authority in religious matters. There are many congregations of the Lord's church, some in our immediate area, which are in various stages of apostasy. Incidentally, in my view, this letter is far more important right now in 1999 than it was in 92. I think you'll see why as I read on. As we see it, the church today is about where it was in 1906 when the liberals took most of the people and most of the buildings. There is, however, a major difference. The liberals of today, except maybe for the actual use of the instrument, are far more liberal than those in 1906. In our judgment, the dangers facing the church today are as great as any that ever face God's people. First century Christians were given dire warnings as to what future generations could expect. Some would trouble you and pervert the gospel. Galatians 1, 7. Beware of false prophets. Matthew 7, 15. Paul exhorted the Ephesian elders to guard against false teachers. Acts 20, 29, 31. Paul warned Timothy that the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Some would cause divisions and occasions of stumbling contrary to the doctrine you received. Romans 16, 17. In writing to Timothy, Paul identifies by name some of those who were causing problems for Paul in the church. 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20. 2 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. 18, 4, 10 through 15. Therefore, since we are shepherds of the flock of God which is among us, 1 Peter 5, 2, we urge you to be on guard, to be aware of the dangers and be ready to confront, contend earnestly for the faith, June 3, and are avoid those who fellowship denominations, 
disregard the plain teaching of Matthew 19 on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Except into their fellowship members of denominations who make no changes in their thinking or their lives. Those who contend that the scriptures do not prohibit worship with instruments of music. Those who promote the new hermeneutic, claiming that the New Testament is not a guidebook or a pattern for us to follow, that the epistles written to the churches of the first century were nothing more than love letters. Place women in positions of leadership in the church and those who preach another gospel, Galatians 1, 7, and abideth not in the teaching of Christ, 2 John 9. Your elders pledge to you that we will do our very best to ensure that the family of God at Burville is fed the truth, Psalms 119, 160, John 8, 32. So, that you will be prepared to recognize error whenever and wherever it occurs. And that you will be willing, as was Joshua and Caleb of old, to stand on God's side. As for your elders, we do not intend to be involved in acts of fellowship with any religious group known to be in direct, clear disobedience to the gospel of Christ. Ephesians 5, 11, 2 John 9. We covet your prayers that we might have the wisdom and the understanding that's necessary to please God in all that we do. We commend the saints at Burville for your love for the truth, for your faithfulness, and your desire to be an ensample to those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.12 May we always glorify God and look to His book for guidance in all that we do in word or deed. We care for each and every one of you. Your brothers in Christ, Rex Owens, Lloyd Goodman, David Smith. I do trust that you agree with me that this letter that we gave to each member of the Burba congregation was worthy of my sharing it with you this morning. Now, in another vein of thought, let me encourage each of you who serve under an eldership to show them appreciation once in a while. When an elder is faithfully fulfilling his responsibilities, it doesn't belittle the office or the man to show him once in a while that he is appreciated. Just a thank you now and then can be a big encouragement to an elder and make him want to keep on keeping on. However, now please get this. However, if a man serves to be honored, to receive the praise of men, Johnny, he should not have been accepted the position in the first place. I relate the following story to impress on your mind the importance of those two little words, thank you. Did not Jesus ask, but where are the nine? Luke 17, 12 through 17. One stormy night in 1860, 
a side-wheeler steamboat was rammed by a lumber schooner in Lake Michigan. 279 of the 393 people on board drowned. One of the survivors was a strong young man from Northwestern University. He was an excellent swimmer. Edward Spencer plunged back into Lake Michigan and swam out to the drowning people. He pulled one of them back to shore and immediately went back for another. In all, he pulled 17 people to safety who would have drowned without his help. But the strain of the ordeal on this young man left him with delirium, rendering him incapacitated. He became an invalid. On his 80th birthday, someone asked Edward Spencer to relate his most vivid memory of that terrible day. He replied, not one of the 17 returned to thank me. Not one. But where are the nine? Yes, these two little words can be very important for the overall well-being of a congregation. Elders should encourage their members to show love and appreciation for each other. Everyone needs to feel loved and wanted. And elders must lead the way with their words and their actions. John 13, 34 through 35. Insofar as it's humanly possible, elders ought to know the flock under their direction. Otherwise, how can we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep? And how can we restore the wayward members if we don't know the congregation? Now, I realize in some of the larger congregations this would be impossible, but to the extent possible, it ought to be done. Depending on the numbers, elders would be glorifying God to visit those in rest homes and hospitals. One of our elders, Rex Owens, does an outstanding job in this area. Several months ago, I visited one of our newer members in a Fort Worth hospital. As I approached her bedside, a look of astonishment came over her face. And then she smiled and said, I never expected an elder to come to see me. Well, that was a rewarding experience for both of us. When elders are busy, tending the flock, and overseeing the work of the church where they serve, there won't be much time left for getting involved with jobs assigned to deacons. In the late 40s, while attending school at, at North Texas University, I had an education professor who had a colleague who was the president of Chicago, Chicago University. And this education professor was lauding the progressiveness and the innovativeness of this college professor. What had he done to deserve to be recognized? This president noticed that the students, 
faculty members were not using the nice broad sideway, sidewalks that the architect for the campus had designed, making the campus both aesthetically pleasing to look at and sidewalks <coughs> wide enough to handle the flow of traffic. So instead of asking and requiring the students to use these nice broad sidewalks, since they were just going wherever they wanted to, he decided the thing to do was to build more sidewalks. So he ordered sidewalks to be built just wherever the students and the faculty were walking, thus severely altering the architect's plan. Many today are building sidewalks that severely alter the master architect of the universe's guidelines and pattern to follow. Many are doing that. Sidewalks are being built that lead God's people where he never intended for them to go. Elders of the large church everywhere are spending too much time with deacons' duties, too little time defending God's word, and too little time looking after the souls in their care. In some churches of Christ, it is becoming scripturally incorrect to denounce denominations or to say too much about the plan of salvation or to put too much stress on baptism or to stress obedience and many other, many other biblical topics keep falling into this incorrect category. Most, I'm afraid that the term most is right, most of our Christian colleges are building sidewalks where students and faculty want to walk. Now we're going to look at just one of these institutions as an example. But as I say, I'm afraid most of them fall into this category. And let's look briefly at Abilene Christian University. Three instructors, two of them teachers at ACU, wrote a book in the late 80s called The Worldly Church, which many of you are familiar with. It was published by ACU. Roy Deaver reviewed the book in 18, I mean in 1989. Biblical Notes, April, March, 89. His conclusions, and these are his words. Let me emphasize in conclusion that the book, The Worldly Church, makes a tremendous contribution to many false doctrines. Its authors want to remake the church according to an image that is not at all the pattern presented in the New Testament. It contributes to, gives support to, at least the following false doctrines. Worship is just whatever you want it to be. Everything a Christian does is worship. The transcendence of God means salvation by grace only. God does not demand obedience in His instructions as set out in the New Testament. And these are just a few of the false doctrines that Brother Deaver enumerated. Following are excerpts from an article appearing in the Abilene Reporter News in the early 90s. The Reverend Stephen Taylor, a former Abilene Christian University professor, will pastor three congregations in the United Kingdom. Reared in the Church of Christ, the former instructor of church history and American history at Abilene Christian University, 
graduated from ACU and from a Presbyterian seminary. He has preached for the Church of Christ, United Church of Christ, Presbyterian Church USA, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, Methodist Episcopal Church, and several community churches. Now, let me ask you a question. What slant do you suppose Stephen Taylor put on his history classes for those students attending ACU? Also, in the early 90s, Christmas at Matthew's house appeared in Wineskins. The article, written by a professor at ACU, ridicules the birth of Christ. If there were ever an article written was, that was blasphemy, this was it. So sidewalks were being built to lead God's people where he never intended for them to go. And very few elders, I'm included, Maxie, in that group, very few elders called ACU's president to voice their concerns. Maybe we were too busy with deacon's work. The church is becoming filled with bright, articulate, charismatic orators who tickle the ears of their listeners and build sidewalks in the wrong direction. 2 Timothy 4, 3. Seven or eight years ago, my wife and I worshiped with a large congregation in San Antonio. The morning worship service was fairly scriptural. Afterwards, I expressed to one of the elders my concern about the unscriptural practices permeating many churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I said, I hope the same thing isn't happening in San Antonio. He replied, I know what you mean. We're going to hold the line here. About six years later, wife and I were again in San Antonio, 1996, worshiping at the scripturally sound Shenandoah Church there. And I was informed at the very moment we were meeting, this church that we had attended a number of years before, six years, was worshiping with a Methodist church in the area at the Methodist church's building. Where were the elders that were planning to hold the line? A so-called gospel preacher on the radio said this to his audience. This just completely blows my mind. Church of Christ preacher, so-called. He claimed to be. All you have to do is call him Father. Just call him Father. Just turn your heart to him right now as I'm speaking. Call him your Father, and your Father will respond. Why don't you do that? Then he offers this prayer. Some refer to as the sinner's prayer. Father, I give my heart to you. I give you my sins. I give you my tears. I give you my fears. I give you my whole life. I accept the gift of your Son on the cross for my sins. And I ask you, Father, to receive me as your child. Through Jesus I pray, amen. This was broadcast over radio station KJAK in Lubbock, Texas in December 1996. And a popular preacher in the Nashville area says, you bet, we'd better change the church or it has no future. Contemporary music must be used to tell the gospel message. Yoke Fellow, November 93. All building sidewalks where the footprints of Jesus would never be found. 
Where? Where are the shepherds of God's people? And they built sidewalks leading to Jubilee and to Promise Keepers and to Willow Creek and to all types of unscriptural destinations. Some elders promoted such and encouraged their church members to walk these sidewalks, thereby putting them on the broad way leading to destruction. Matthew 7, 13. During this past year, I heard about a large Church of Christ congregation that was contemplating putting out a manifesto, posting it, and sending it out that listed their beliefs and practices. And then they would add below that these words. If you agree with the above, then we would love for you to come and join us. However, if your beliefs about worship do not coincide with ours, then you would probably be happier worshiping somewhere else. Can you imagine even in your wildest dreams of a church considering this, an eldership that would even consider such a thing? What part would the Bible play in such action? What have we come to? What have we come to, Bobby? Where are we going? What hope is there for the church if elders fail to fulfill their responsibilities? What hope is there? May God help his elders to be gentle, kind, caring shepherds. May he guide us away from forcing preachers into the role of pastors. And may he help us see to it that deacons are not deprived of the opportunity to do their jobs and complete their assignments. And may God grant his elders throughout the world the knowledge and the wisdom to stand in the trenches and build sidewalks that lead people in God's way as directed through His Holy Word, always giving God the glory. Thank you.